God, thank you for the way your spirit has moved here through music and, and words and hearts today. Continue to let that grace cover this place, cover our lives, that your spirit might move among us according to your plan. In Christ's name, amen. We're in Ephesians, the second chapter. I'll give you a moment to find that. We're going to read the first 10 verses of chapter 2. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Paul writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You've lived here your entire life in the U.S., that is. You may not recognize it. I know I don't, but we have in our language system what we call idioms. They're all too common in American English. An idiom is a phrase or an expression that if you take the actual meaning of each word, it's, it's different from what you mean when you say this, this phrase. In the 2006 movie version of the Pink Panther. Uh, with my sense of humor, it's one of my favorites. Um, there's a French police officer, and he's discussing with Inspector Clouseau, who's played by Steve Martin. They're discussing a murder case, and the officer says to him, and now he is pushing up the daisies. And Steve Martin listens, Inspector Clouseau, and he says, he's not pushing up the daisies, he is dead. <laughs> The officer glares at him and he says, It's an idiom! To which Clouseau responds appropriately, No, you, sir, are the idiom. <laughs> Having a student uh, from Hungary with us this past year, the better part of a year, I've become more aware of just how often I am the idiom. How we speak and it doesn't make sense to someone who's not familiar. One of the first nights Fanny was with us, we were talking with her and, and Robin and I said, well, you know, we need to get up early tomorrow, so we're going to go hit the sack. And she just got this blank expression on her face and, and looked at us like, what are you talking about? What is this sack you're talking about and why are you going to be hitting it? Just think of the idiom conversations we have or could have. Like, uh, well, you ready to go back to the salt mines today? And no, I was under the weather. Yeah, and it was raining cats and dogs. And tomorrow will be a baptism by fire when you go back. Make sure you pitch in. I'll be on the ball. If you're not, you'll face the music. And we just go on and on with these phrases that what in the world is going on here? A non-American would be totally, totally confused. We recently put together a church brochure that... Um, Kathy did a, just a great job on, and, and we're making sure if you're newer to First Baptist that you get one to find a little bit 
about us, find out a little bit about us. And after the fact, I thought, Kathy, man, we could have just put a bunch of idioms in there. It would have been a, a cool thing. And could have said things like, at First Baptist, you're welcome here, whether or not you wore your Sunday best. And maybe it took an act of God, but we're glad you took time to darken the doors. And <laughs> you might expect church folk to act all high and mighty, but uh, we will not be holier than thou. And don't worry about stepping on toes or sitting in the wrong pew. We'll do our best. And we are not the church of the almighty dollar, and we try not to have sacred cows. And if you bring your friend, you can do so whether or not you consider yourself your brother's keeper. <laughs> Kathy's really glad she got them printed before this idea came to my head. This whole idiom focus is, is really a part of our text today. If you listen to what Paul is saying, listen to verses two, 1 and 2 again. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient among us. From Paul's perspective, when you listen to this, Paul is literally saying, you are a piece of work. And we know we are familiar with that idiom, with that phrase, because being a piece of work to us is generally not complimentary. Being a piece of work is someone who has the pattern of, of speaking and acting that is, is really contemptuous. We don't like it. It's, it's somebody who's always late. It's somebody who's, who's always right, which my wife tells me, by the way, that I am. It's somebody who's constantly making inappropriate comments, always cheating, always pushing the envelope, taking shortcuts, just in general being a real pain. From Paul's perspective, though, being a piece of work is not all bad. He uses this idea to paint a before and after picture of our lives. Before putting our faith in Christ, Paul says, we are, a, we are the piece of work of the ruler of the power of the air, a.k.a. Satan. We are his piece of work. However, he says, after Jesus begins working in our lives, we become God's workmanship. We become pieces of God's work for God's glory. That image of Christ, of Jesus working in our lives, of, of being His piece of work, it's a great one. It's one we've been focusing on as a body. Those who are prepping to join First Baptist Church on, on April 1st, Easter Sunday, they've been putting that work of Christ into print and writing their story and thinking about it. Because our story is all about being pieces of work, isn't it? When we think about our lives, the piece of work we were without Christ and the piece of work we are now becoming. Over time, for some all the way back to childhood, for some more recently, we can literally see God's work taking place in our lives. One board at a time, one nail at a time, one conversation at a time. We can see that work happening in our lives, in our friendships, in our decisions. Even in our being here this morning, when you think about how you came today, maybe that you didn't used to come or how you used to come, it's changing, I think, in people's lives. They look forward to the time being together. We look back to life before Christ, even the struggles that some of us have today as believers. We talked about in Bible study this morning that there are struggles that continue for us as believers. Everything doesn't just go away and there's no more struggle with sin. We see that in verses 1 and 2, that we were dead through our trespasses and sins. The work in us was taking place according to the course of the world, the way the world works. And a spirit was at work in us through our disobedience. Paul uses two different words. You might have noticed them, transgressions and sins. And many interpreters, as they look at this passage, would say that Paul uses the word transgressions to speak to the Jews who received the covenant from God back in, in Moses' time, way back who received that covenant and knew about the covenant and yet were choosing to do things that they knew they shouldn't do. They were intentionally breaking the covenant. And then Paul also writes to the Gentiles. And Paul talks about them as sinning 
And in talking to them, he's saying, well, they're sinning in a way that they didn't realize until they were told. They didn't know they were breaking the rules. They didn't know they were going against God until someone told them. And then they could repent. Paul says that we're not what we are created to be when we allow ourselves to be shaped by the course of this world, whether we realize it or not. Let me give you a couple of examples. I'm around and in front of young people every day. And when that's your lot in life, you undergo a fair amount of scrutiny. That's part of what teenagers do. It's not a bad thing, but they notice how you look. They notice what you wear. They notice how you talk. One day I had on my sweats and a a t-shirt, a basketball t-shirt in in the classroom, which is another story how that happened. But one of my students, who's a freshman, said to me real real earnestly, not trying to be out of line or anything, he said, Mr. Voigt, let me help you out. I said, how are you going to help me out? He said, why don't you untuck that shirt from your sweatpants? It would look a lot better. (laughs) Who knew I was breaking fashion rule 101? But he helped me out. The more we open ourselves to Scripture, the more we meet as believers in times like this or in study times or in even just meeting for coffee, the deeper the Spirit delves in our lives and says to us, you know what? Let me help you out. As a believer, you really shouldn't do that. There's a better way you could approach that area of your life. There's a better way to talk to somebody than what you've been doing. And the Spirit does that, and we continue to learn. And you know what? If we want our spirits to to stay young, I think that's what does it. It's being open to instruction, even from a 14-year-old, to say, you know what? I can learn. I can continue to grow. I can learn from the Spirit of God. Back in the fall, this is the second story of of maybe the other kind of transgression that Paul talks about. There were so many things to adjust to in opening a new high school. Something I had done for years in a lot of ways became brand new, like a new covenant. One of the things I didn't like about it is that we were told that every day when we came to work, we needed to clock in. That is, enter your ID on an, on an iPad and, and the time and all that would come up that you arrived. And something in me just didn't like that. I really rebelled against it. I thought, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm a respectable worker. I get here on time. I've got a decent reputation. I get here early. I don't need somebody keeping track of me. And I resented it. That's self-justification, isn't it? I don't have to submit to somebody's rule. So for about the first week, I didn't. I just would come in the building, go up to my room, and, and go about my business. And no administrator, no supervisor, no facilitator ever came and, and called me on it. I didn't get a reprimand. So, you know, see, well, no big deal. Then at a volleyball match, a colleague of mine who doesn't even teach at the same school came to me afterward and said, Hey, I hear you're not signing in. (laughs) Little silent protest, huh? She said. And I just thought, oh, man. Word was out. I was a convicted covenant breaker. Clock in felony in the first degree. I mean, that was... But, you know, I haven't missed a day signing in since. Because aren't we called to obey the covenant? Aren't we called to listen to what is required and expected, even if we don't like it? There isn't every part about being a believer that I like. There are things we're called to do that say, God, I just don't like to do that. But what are we called to do? We're called to as much as we know how to keep the covenant. We might think sometimes our covenant breaking goes unnoticed. We think that in our own relationship with God. But it doesn't. It doesn't by God for sure and probably more so by others in our lives than we care to realize. We might think that even in relationship to God, we are above certain rules, but 
Scripture tells us we're not. That's the beauty, I think, of being a part of a body. And I recognize it again this morning in class as we talked and listened to each other. And that's that we help and we encourage each other to live to that standard of Christ that that we profess, that we believe in. And even better, we get we get to remind each other that we are pieces of work. Now, I want you to turn to whoever's next to you and just say to them with all your heart, you are a piece of work. Go ahead. <laughs> Some of you have waited a long time for that opportunity. <laughs> From verse 4, honestly, we are now God's pieces of work. The verse says he took us from, from being useless to being dead pieces of the devil's work and, and transformed and even now transforming us. God restores us to pieces of God's work for God's purposes, and that's a pretty good thing makes us alive in Christ even when we're dead in our transgressions. That's grace. We are grace embodied. And we come to verse 6. And as we do that, picture yourself at, we'll say, at the complex. And you have someone, maybe a child or grandchild, who's going to be in a big event that night at the complex, and you know how it can get really full sometimes. And you just happen to get there a little late. You were running late, and you didn't get there as early as you'd like, and there's a long line, and you're waiting in line, and, and it's starting to look doubtful that you're going to get in on time, if you even make it in at all, because it's a big event. And just when it seems bleak, a friend, a buddy, comes out and, and sees you standing in line. And says, hey, I'm glad I saw you. Come on. I got here early. I bought your ticket. And I've saved seats in the seventh row right in the center. They're great. And you think, yes. And you just bypass all those other poor fools out there. And you go right on in. <laughs> and you take your seat. And it's perfect. And in verse 6, that's what we have. It says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. That's already the way we are, it says, in Christ. God raised us up past tense, seated us in the heavenly realms. Wrap your mind around that for a few moments or for a day or for a week. But that's already happened in Christ. We've been raised up. We're seated with Him already. God's grace. In verse 7, God's kindness to us. Christ has bought our ticket. He's brought us into the theater. We're seated with Him. By grace we've been saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of work, so that none of us, not one of us can boast. So now we're in the theater, right? And we're safely seated. We're in that moment of anticipation, you know, when the lights start to dim and if there's an orchestra there warming up and you hear them and, and you just are ready for it to start. And that's all about to happen. And now God says to you, you know, by the way, I want you to get up on stage. I want you to be part of the program. And God says that to us. But when God says it, it's not that response that, oh man, I can't do this. But when God comes to us, we're not shocked that He does and we're not frightened. We start to realize that God has had a part planned for us, which Scripture tells us from the very beginning. Things He's prepared in advance for us to do. That part fits who we are. We discover in Christ that we truly are God's pieces of work designed and created in the way that God has in mind. In certain ways that contribute to God's plan. It's like our, our original mission all the way back to, to the garden stuff has been restored. And what we do in Christ helps bring more people into the theater. 
We're God's regents. We're God's representatives. We are pieces of work carrying out God's work. This past Wednesday night was so, I don't know, fulfilling, I guess is the word I'd say for me personally. Just to stand back and watch and listen to all the pieces of work that God has assembled here together, that he's brought into this theater called First Baptist Church. To think about the way we are now and who we are now and the possibilities of of what will be through all of us together. Things I, I couldn't, I don't think any of us could have pictured six months ago. It's a really, really cool thing that God's doing. And then to think six months ahead that that God will have done things that we can't even imagine right now. That's what's great about being part of God's work. It's like God keeps outdoing what we can think or even dream. And I love that, maybe most of all, about being a body. It's funny because at school, students will sometimes tell me, you know, Mr. Voigt, every time we get to a, a new chapter or a new topic, Every time you always say that new concept is your favorite. (laughs) And there's some truth to that. They're right. I, I do say that a lot, I think. But maybe that's because when we come to the stage, when we come to a new chapter in life or a new day, and we start to think about and anticipate what might be, when we see people discover and grow together, It is just about the best thing ever. It's almost like we were made for it, huh? Let's pray together this morning. God, you've moved here today in in many, many powerful ways. Some that we looked forward to and saw coming and, and some that surprised us. And God, that's not unlike how our lives are. We recognize as we come before you that there have been times in life, and a time even before we knew Christ, that we lived according to the the way the world was and according to Satan who works in the world. But God, we realize too that it's your grace that has brought us to this place right now. It's your grace that has given us hope in Christ, and by faith we cling to that. And it's you, God, who restores us as your pieces of work to the way and to the purposes for which we are intended. And God, we look forward to moving ahead together, discovering more and more what your plans are for us. We know you'll be faithful to unveil them and reveal them day by day, moment by moment. And we come to you together in great praise.